like to introduce our last speaker, Matt Daniels. Matt has spoken here before. Matt, come up and tell us what good of all is. So I'm speaking last today, so I'm the anti-climax. Um, I have a sobering topic. Uh, I'll say that up front. Um, but it's one where there's um, actually real hope for victory uh, if you look past uh, the, uh, the threat. I want to talk to you about um, trends uh, that are going to ultimately threaten all of your existing investments in Christian ministries, Christian churches, your own Christian business, Christian schools um, that are at work in our culture and that are going to hit hardest here in California. You guys are the canary in the mine for some of these trends. That's why we spend a lot of time here in Southern California. A um, little background on me. So I'm an attorney with a PhD in politics. My wife, who's a physician, says I have more degrees than a thermometer and I'm less useful around the home. <laughs> Just a, she tells me I'm not a real doctor and she makes jokes about where doctors put thermometers and I'm not going to go there. All right. <laughs> I cut my teeth building social movements, uh, working on the uh, effort to protect marriage from destruction by the courts, and I did it because I knew the implications of religious freedom that would flow from that. Um, so I was the founder of a group called the Alliance for Marriage. We drafted the federal marriage amendment that was voted on uh, during the Bush administration. Um, now we're preparing for sort of the next phase of that struggle, if you will, um, to protect rights of conscience for people of faith. Um, I've had an interesting journey. The Lord led me through my human rights and civil rights education work uh, to become chair of law and human rights at a graduate school of international affairs in Washington, D.C. called the Institute of World Politics. Most of you have never heard of it, and there's a reason for that. Um, half the students in our school are from the intelligence community, so it's a school for spies, basically. And um, <clears throat> it's a great place. My, uh, my office is in the former KGB headquarters in Washington, D.C., which was acquired by a government agency after the KGB vacated it. Um, uh, I work uh, right across from the William Casey Library, where all of his memoirs are stored. Um, and I have an interesting ministry to folks in the intelligence community. Why are they interested in me? Well, this is not the subject of my presentation, but I'm going to mention it. It's because the same exact uh, engine that drives the work I do domestically can be used internationally. The engine that drives the work I do domestically is this common grace truth called the Imago Dei, people made in the image of God, right? So it's, it's, it's woven into the fabric of reality. It's written on the human heart, and it reflects the love of God for all his children made in his image. We're very familiar with this concept. The world doesn't know it, you know, does not know this concept. And so when we harness it, when we draw upon it, we, um, we harness the power of truth. Well, guess what? <coughs> in working online, doing human rights education, um, I have built a massive following among Muslim young people around the world, especially women who love our message of human dignity. Pe we don't say people made in the image of God. We talk about human dignity. Um, and so that ha led uh, <laughs> the folks at IWP to approach me and say, hey, you're doing counterterrorism. Did you know that? <laughs> We like what you do. Um, and you know they see us as winning the war of uh, ideas against radical Islamist organizations. We're seeding uh, young hearts and minds with ideas that crowd out the ideas of extremism and hatred. Uh, so we've gotten endorsements from two former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs, the former commander of NATO, the chair of the Homeland Security Advisory Council, the former director of the FBI. They love us in the UK. We've been endorsed by the UK. Uh, Attorney General, the Chief Crown Prosecutor's Office. Last week I spoke at the UK Defense Academy. They have a huge problem in the UK with people returning from Syria who are now in the UK population. Do you know that every public university in the UK that has any sizable immigrant population has at least one full-time recruiter for ISIS and Al-Qaeda on campus? And so there's a battle going on right now for the minds and hearts of the next generation of Muslim young people. So that's what we do internationally. But I'm here to talk about my domestic work. Um, 
Let's talk about the origin of the civil rights movement for a moment. The origin of the civil rights movement was in the faith community. So it's rather ironic that the concepts, the language, the principles of civil rights are now being deployed against freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, faith-based institutions, faith-based businesses. Um, there's, a, there's a clue to the solution in that irony, in that we've got to reclaim the high ground of civil rights. We've got to reclaim the language of civil rights for people of faith and all Americans if we're going to keep the doors open for the gospel, for religious freedom, for faith-based institutions in America. You've seen some of the battles here in California. How many of you followed that recent bill that was attacking the freedom of faith-based higher educational institutions? You guys were aware of that? I mean, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. That, that's just, these will be, you get, we will look back on these days as the days of wine and roses. So we need to prepare now. That's the sobering part of this. But if we prepare, if we're thoughtful, if we hang together and not separately, as Lincoln said, uh, we have a chance. We, um, now here's the problem, as I see it. Christians in America, people of faith, uh, Jews, Mormons, uh, Catholics, Evangelicals, uh, we have law on our side, properly interpreted. We have history on our side. We have facts on our side. But we're being attacked in the name of a false narrative. Uh, a narrative that compares us to Jim Crow bigots and racists because of our faith. This narrative is historically, legally, socially, morally false. Um, the project that I'm working on domestically is called the King Rights Initiative. The King Rights Initiative is an effort to do jujitsu, if you will, and reclaim the narrative of civil rights for people of faith and faith-based institutions and all Americans so that freedom of conscience remains a fundamental civil right in the United States. Um, the uh, the King Rights Initiative term is a double entendre. That means a word with two meanings. It refers to Dr. King himself, obviously, but it also refers to the King of Heaven, who's the only source of our rights. Um, and it's designed to rally the body of Christ in all of its diversity around a model and a message that can help us to keep the doors open for faith and for faith-based institutions. Um, the good news is that uh, whereas our the, the, the groups and forces opposed to us use the language of civil rights. They don't understand the origin, the foundation, or the spiritual principles that actually allow for civil rights. In fact, they are actively opposed to them. So we've got the, the DNA of civil rights, which was gospel DNA, belongs to God's people. You realize that, right? The civil rights movement succeeded because it had gospel DNA. They believed that people were made in the image of God. They believed in an affirmative duty to disobey unjust laws. They believed in loving their enemies, overcoming evil with good. They succeeded because of gospel principles, and we need to harness those again. My eyes were open to this when I recruited Andrew Young, who was one of Dr. King's lieutenants, to be an endorser and a face for our cause. Had a lot of meetings with Andrew Young, and he told me stories that made me realize that my view of the civil rights movement has been secularized by reading it through secular histories. He told me in the early days of the civil rights movement, they were constantly led by the spirit. He said, it's the only reason we succeeded. We would be planning to go to place A, and someone would have a dream at night saying, go to place B, and we would go to place B, and there, would have, there was a bomb at place A that would have killed the entire leadership of the civil rights movement in its infancy, and we succeeded because we were led by the spirit. And I thought, oh, we're going to have to do that again. <laughs> Sounds like we're going to be doing that again. Um, I'm not going to show you a lot of videos, but let me show you two clips of Andrew Young from a Georgia PBS documentary that we finished recently that give you a sense of the tone and the substance of what we're about. So let's play those. Well, the black church was the only institution that we totally controlled and that had little or no white influence in it. And so people would say what they really felt. They felt secure. Uh, they felt empowered. And they believed that um, the cause of race relations was just because they read about it in the Bible. We were able to desegregate the South that had been segregated for, through slavery for almost 400 years. And we didn't kill anybody. And a few of us were killed, uh, but we didn't destroy any property. 
we made sure that nonviolence was the way that we could help America grow in grace and in the purity of its own vision. Now, if you want to understand how we got from that to where we are today with movements like Black Lives Matter and, and all the endless distortion of civil rights by the gay and lesbian movement and lots of other groups, I can't explain that in a 15-minute presentation, but I'm going to come back in a month. Bill Erickson, who has been uh, a great source of encouragement, and his wife, Connie, uh, are offering to host an event where I can do a deeper download with you that will explain how we got to where we are. I can also tell you about our progress in recruiting more authentic African-American leaders and in institutions like Hampton University, Booker T. Washington's alma mater in Virginia is a historic black Christian college that's going to create all of our educational materials and resources. The Martin Luther King Advisory Council of Georgia uh, is, has endorsed us. They're the official Georgia state entity charged with promoting the legacy of Dr. King. We've got lots of African-American and Latino leaders supporting us. And um, the short sort of bottom line for you guys is in a post-Christian culture where people don't believe in moral absolutes, the highest moral authority for most people is human law, okay? This is why whoever owns civil rights owns the future. They own the next generation and they own our culture. That's why civil rights is a battleground. Okay, that's just kind of the bottom line. We've got to reclaim the high ground of civil rights for all Americans, including people of faith, with an authentic model rooted in truth, or our kids and grandkids are going to pay a terrible price. The good news is um, most Americans are with us. Most Americans know that the faith community is on the cutting edge of dealing with poverty and social problems that the state cannot fix. They're not angry at the faith community. They don't hate, the, the activists hate the faith community, but most Americans know the faith community is doing good. And we can draw upon that reservoir of popular support. The other reason to be encouraged, God will have mercy for the sake of a remnant. In my travels, I've realized how big the remnant is in this culture compared to Europe. Don't ask me about the UK, it's a mess. Um, God is not going to let the gospel light go out in this country. Um, but we need to get started now, especially here in California, because you guys are the canary in the mine. What we've got to do is draw upon the moral capital that God has given us. You know, the world is still amazed internationally that the American South did not become Rwanda. Human nature and the laws of politics should have led the American South to become Rwanda, okay? It was the greatest moment for the gospel in the history of the United States that we overcame our national sins of slavery and segregation without bloodshed. By and large, some lives were shed. Dr. King was martyred. There were other martyrs. But there was no bloodbath because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to draw upon that moral bank account in order to reclaim the high ground of civil rights. And we're going to do it by loving our enemies, overcoming evil with good, and walking in the way that the original founders of the civil rights movement walked. As the culture around us grows darker, people will be drawn to that just like they were drawn to it in the American South. So be encouraged. We can win the battle, but we got to get started now. Thank you. God bless you. Let's pray for Matt. Father, I just uh, thank you for folks like Matt that will fight those battles that are just so incredibly difficult and so incredib incredibly complicated. Lord, most of us don't even understand them or, or, or understand the depth of them and the, uh, the importance of them. So I just thank you for him. Pray, Lord, that uh, you would give him whatever he needs to uh, um, continue to carry that flag, Lord, and, and to uh, defend our civil rights. We just thank you for him. And, uh, Lord, we would just lift that up to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well... <coughs> Good news for all of you. You've got the book by Bo Crescetto, which is on your, your table, so make sure that there's a, there should be four on every table, so uh, some of you can take that. Some of you may be out of luck, but make sure you take that with you when you leave. Also, a generous person uh, bought 40 books of I Like Giving uh, to give away, and uh, you can pick up one of those 40 copies of those, that book at the table back there, so if you're one of the first 40 people as you leave, uh, you can pick one of those books up, so thank you for whoever did that. Well, we've been on quite a journey today, huh? First, Brian Feller came up there and talked to us about what's going on at NCF and 100X, and then Bob came up and gave us a, just a gentle nudge. 
That's what will we be doing when Christ returns. And next we heard from Seahorses, Paul Gizzi, shared how they use soccer as a tool to help people internationally and right here locally. And then we got to go down to Mexico and we heard DJ's story of his faithfulness 24 years ago when he and his wife moved down to Mexico and took over an orphanage and the fruit that God has borne through them. After that, Russ came up and shared about a trip to the Philippines. And can we get three, four, five guys who might take their gifts and skills, maybe their Xbox skills there, on a quick trip to the Philippines? And then Brad challenged us, shared some pretty crazy stories about giving and the joy it brings us. And then I think his son Drew kind of shamed us. Beth shared her wisdom and how you know, they serve other ministries by giving their wisdom and, and what they've learned away. But how it all started with just some hamburgers with an orphanage in an orphanage in Mexico and how it put her on a new path that changed her life and the lives of thousands and thousands of others. And then Connie answered the question, why the Barnabas Group? And I hope if you're a guest here today that you're going to join. And then Justice showed us what the back engine of fundraising is all about and what it looks like for ministry. And hopefully as a board member and as a ministry, we might take away some things from that that we can use. And then Mike Broyles came up and talked to us about the prisoners and how they can have reconciliation with their kids through our efforts. And finally, Matt came and gave us a glimpse of what might be if we don't pay attention to the danger that's staring us in the face. So quite a morning. So let me just pray to let you go. And when you leave, if you would take your lanyards and just drop them in the, the bucket outside, believe it or not, we went through all the lanyards that we had except for three. So that's quite a group that we had here today. And then make sure, if you are a partner, so I don't have to put another dollar in the bucket, if you are a partner in the Barnabas group, that you pick up your Barnabas bear today as you leave. Okay, Susie, Penelope, those gals will be out there to help you. So let me just pray for you guys. Father, incredible morning, as always. And uh, Lord, the 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 desires and passions that you put in various people is just beyond our imagination. And we just thank you that we get to listen to what they do, that we can be encouraged. Some of the things, you know, it may not be for us. Some of the things might really touch us. It might draw us. It might change our lives, Lord. But, Father, you have put these passions and desires in these people, and it's just incredible to be here today and listen to what you are doing. Lord, how would you use us? How would you use us? I pray those Barbara's group bears go home and they sit there and they continue to ask that question just day after day and that we would see fruit born from all of that. So I just lift this up to you and pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. All right, you guys, have a great day. Drive carefully on the way home. Thank you very much for coming.